OK, um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob McGuire-Dale, and I'm a front-end uh, developer at REI. And um, I really hate speaking in front of crowds. And uh, one thing that I do to help myself uh, be less nervous about that is just to say that I'm nervous speaking in front of crowds. So I apologize for all the ums and nervousness that, um, anyway, I apologize beforehand for that. Um, anyway, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a front end developer at REI. And this is my presentation on us trying to um, get into the open source space in the, uh, in the contribution sense. So. Um, we, uh, yeah, th this is, um, um, yeah, so what is the speech about exactly? So this is a, a story of an ongoing journey, and it's about preparing uh, a large cooperative for open source contributions. So, um, and this is also from one software engineer's perspective. So this is from my perspective in particular, and I think public affairs would like me to say something to the effect of the views expressed in this presentation are those of mine personally. I do not reflect necessarily reflect the views of REI or something like that. Anyway, this is this is my views and perspectives and and whatnot. So I also wanted to set uh, some expectations about about what this presentation is not. So it's not an, an instruction manual for implementing open source contributions uh, at your organization. Um, nor is it a story with a conclusion, unfortunately. So since this is an ongoing journey, it's going to be, um, uh, I think, an uphill battle with a lot of uh, different groups internally with REI. Um, and unfortunately, it's also not very long. We ended up not getting as far as I wanted in our journey before, the, uh, before this conference. Um, but I figured that um, it's, it, it might still be useful and valuable to some of you. Um, but yeah, REI has been around for 75 years. Uh, bureaucracy, the wheels of bureaucracy move kind of slowly. Um, that's, ju that's just how it goes. So um, what I wanted to do, because it's not very long, is open up uh, some time after the session for you all to um, maybe tell some stories about trying to implement open source contributions in your organizations. Um, you know, you all are at Open Source Bridge, so I'm guessing a lot of you already work for very open source friendly companies. Um, but maybe you guys have some stories. So um, while I'm giving this presentation, think about um, the successes and challenges, and maybe some advice that you all might have uh, for the rest of us. So as I mentioned before, I'm a front end developer, and I work on REI.com. So um, I, work on, I, I work among about 40 software developers and SDETs and uh, manual testers to help get the website and mobile apps and even our cash register machines up and running. So I work on the platform team, and I have sort of a DevOps role. Um, I like to consider myself the back end of the front end. Um, I'm a, a bit of a unique front end developer in the sense that I don't really like the display layer that much. Um, so I know that's kind of weird, but I, um, I really love the accessibility and ubiquity of the web browser, and I love my code running very closely to the user. Um, so because I don't really like the display layer and I'm kind of a, um, a platform DevOps troll, uh, I like working on things like our build system. So um, I sort of help front-end development uh, have things that have existed in programming since the 60s. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that programmers take for granted, like dependency management and modularity and basic unit testing. Front-end languages don't really have any of that natively. So uh, I help give the front-end developers that. So you could say that I help make front-end languages almost like real programming languages. I also work on some uh, visualization and code stability and um, analyzation and da uh, dashboarding so we can measure how our changes um, affect the code base over time. So that's fun too. Um, also help with organization. So um, I like to say that, the f that front end work is hard because front end is easy. And what I mean by that is front end development has uh, almost no guardrails compared to many languages. You can kind of do whatever you want. You can code in whatever way that you want. So uh, I help. Um, put some quality control and some standardizations, help inject a little bit of computer science and, and uh, software engineering principles into the front end. Also work on hiring. Um, they let me in, so I figured I'd have to raise the bar a little bit. Um, help uh, created a series of interview exercises that help us evaluate not only the uh, candidate's coding skills, but also their um, software engineering abilities. So um, how do they construct their commits? And what features do they decide to prioritize given time constraints, et cetera? Anyway, that's just what I do. I figured since this is open source bridge, I should tell you a little bit about my open source background. So I started in college at the OSU Open Source Lab. Have you guys heard of the Open Source Lab? 
sure some of you have. Yes, great organization. I actually worked with this guy uh, back in the day. Um, but anyway, I feel like this is really um, where a lot of the um, software developers there cut their engineering teeth. I think a lot of us learned more about software engineering working at the open source lab than we did getting our degrees. Uh, that's not saying anything about the school, but you know, it's just the nature of it, I suppose. Um, so yeah, longtime supporter of open source. I, uh, I do recognize the irony presenting on a MacBook. Um, so anyway, also worked at Boeing. I wanted to point out uh, Boeing because I was part of sort of an internal open source, I like to call it. So Boeing is a very um, restrictive company in the sense that um, there's a lot of controls and a lot of scrutiny over what kinds of uh, software that you use there. Um, so you can't just bring in anything. You can't just download any library um, because they're a government contractor. They have to have to be very careful about that. Um, so. I wanted to point that out. I worked on projects like the Open Source Toolkit, was, which was sort of a, a conduit for uh, developers there to use open source software, et cetera. And I wanted to point out Boeing because um, I think that even if you don't practice open source in its entirety, sometimes it's still uh, valuable, I think, to practice elements of open source. So I think if you have an organization and the organization isn't 100% comfortable on letting you just contribute willy-nilly to open source, that it's still valuable to sort of follow the same open source uh, me um, methodologies, open source practices, et cetera. Um, and now I work at REI, and it's sort of my uh, personal crusade to bring open source contributions to the cooperative. Um, so, uh, yeah, I want to do things like speak at open, open source conferences, so this is my first one, so this is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's my goal, and this presentation is sort of part of my goal in getting the cooperative ready for it. So, um, so how did this journey begin for us? So this uh, open source journey and this desire to um, bring open source contributions to our um, to, uh, to the cooperative really started with um, uh, the engineers, sort of a grassroots movement. Um, we have a lot of open source savvy uh, engineers who believe as all of us do. Um, we also have a history of using proprietary software and companies who like to have part of their business model um, be dependents. So they give us things like incomplete documentation that increases our dependence on these companies. We recognize that as sort of an, uh, um, an ethically bad thing. So we tend to steer towards, uh, towards open source. Um, so our infrastructure also runs on open source. So we have, uh, we're running a uh, Java stack. We use Maven to build things. We use Jenkins for our continuous integration. Um, you know, Apache and, and Node.js and uh, hundreds of other um, open source licenses and tools. Um, part of our most motivation too is um, it's uh, for kind of hippie reasons. So if you know anybody who works at REI and in the stores, um, REI has a kind of a deep culture of um, you know passionate people who like to give back and, and whatnot. So the um, engineers are are really no different. There are a lot of people who just just want to give back just for the whole point of giving back. We um, we feel like it it extends um, this culture extends the software and it's not really something that um, the cooperative has thought about before. But that's sort of the the angle we're, pu we're pushing. So also, we want to increase the quality of our code. And um, there's uh, Linus's law, his famous quote of, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And that's been said uh, a million times. And uh, this, is, this is from the cathedral and the bazaar in particular. So we understand that all of our software is going to have bugs. And we want to be able to leverage the community to help us find and possibly fix those bugs sooner than later, because they're going to have to be fixed later uh, eventually. So we might as well. Um, find those soon, sooner before they, they ship to production, and then it becomes really expensive for us to fix. Um, but also, it, I, I think that it'll help us write higher quality code, because I think if a software engineer writes a piece of code that has his or her name attached to it, I'm hoping that um, they would have a higher standard, a standard of quality when they release the code. They don't want recruiters running across it, et cetera. Um, also, we want to let the community hack and remix. So, um, the engineers are busy. We only have a, a certain amount of time. We don't get to do everything that we want to do. So, um, you know, we want to do things like be able to release our APIs and our software and let the community really, uh, really go at it. 
Um, but, the, but the last reason is really for some more selfish reasons. It's for dev cred. So um, you know, we have a reputation as software developers. And uh, I'm from the Seattle area, so I live and work with people who work for Microsoft and Amazon and whatnot. So um, I think a lot of us are kind of tired of going to parties. And then they learn where we work for. And they're like, oh, you know, you're, just, you're just a web dev. You just work on a website. You know, that hurts a little bit. You got to like, you know, we want to be able to like, you know, really uh, establish uh, ourselves as contributors to the open source community. Be like, actually, we do do some really interesting things, and and uh, here's what we do. Also, you know, attracting developers. Open source is a great way to do that. Um, also, we want to we want to play. We want to be able to participate in open source conferences like this and hackathons um, in the local development community. So that's that's really where the motivation begins um, is with the engineers. So, um, so how did this, uh, this movement actually start? So it was a bit of a covert open source community um, effort. So we went out, and the very first thing that we did was get a, uh, an account on GitHub called REI Dev. You can go there now. There's some stuff up there. Um, but uh, also, we just realized we, we needed that now. Some of the front end developers, we uh, were maturing as a discipline, and we wanted some code style guides. There's some very uh, excellent code style guides out there, including um, Airbnb has some really good front end code style guides. And we needed a GitHub account so we could fork it. And well, we, don't, we didn't actually technically need that, but we thought it was a good opportunity to sort of um, get us into that, into that space. Um, so this was also deemed a bit innocuous by management. We kind of let our direct management know about this, but it was still kind of kind of secret. We didn't really announce it to anybody, um, but uh, we figured that no one's going to really care if they know how to um, if they know our coding standards. <laughs> so we figured that that was a that was a good place to start. Uh, we also started submitting upstream patches in official capacities via GitHub. So uh, we've contributed to projects like Istanbul, which is a JavaScript code coverage tool. Um, the node package management system, Nexus, Maven, et cetera. So all of this was done sort of using our, uh, our somewhat in, uh, shadowed uh, open source community. <laughs> um, also, a number of the engineers, we have personal projects that we work on after work and uh, on the weekends. And sometimes these projects have the intention of us using them at work, but we'll go on the weekends, and we're not at work, we're not on work time, so we'll release it under our own copyright, under our own open source license, and uh, then consume it internally. So um, that sounds a little shaky, but it's, it's kind of what uh, one of the loopholes that we found to help um, kind of contribute to the open source community, but not officially as, uh, as REI. Um, so, I've only been working at REI for about 15 months, maybe 16 months, and yes, I'm still measuring my time uh, at the cooperative like you would a baby uh, who's under two years old. Um, but I figured that I wasn't the first one who, who, uh, who wanted to solve these problems. So I started digging around in the code. Um, I don't know if you guys have had these uh, experiences where you're working on some difficult engineering problem and you're digging around in the code and you see these ghostly footprints of someone who was there before and you're saying, oh my god, someone's been here before, someone's failed, let's figure out how they failed and uh, let's um, sort of adjust our approach to the engineering problem based on these uh, scary, scary findings. So I found some scary findings. Um, it turns out that we have this, um, this domain, code.rei.com, that's just sitting right there on the perimeter blocked by some simple firewall, firewall rule. And this is an amazing internal website. It documents our um, service-based architecture. It has APIs. Uh, it even has a, an engineering blog. These are, these are all things that um, you know, p engineers were writing about all these interesting problems that they wanted to, um, that they solved, um, all just sitting on the, on the perimeter. And uh, so I started asking around. And it turns out that um, it got shut down by security. And security was like, you know, we don't want uh, our infrastructure documented, and uh, I know that security through obscurity isn't really security, but um, I suppose it's an extra layer of, of security, and they wanted to, uh, um, what do you call that, maintain, maintain that uh, a, a little bit of extra security. Um, so based on all this archaeological evidence, we were able to uh, approach how we introduced the idea of open source contributions to the cooperative. So we already learned that security doesn't like us publicly documenting our infrastructure. So um, what, uh, what our plan is to do is to um, introduce front-end libraries first, because front-end libraries, they're available to anyone who's interested. They're available to anyone who knows how to right-click on a browser and save view source. Um, you guys can look through our code right now. Um, it's not exactly secret, so we figured that that would be more uh, palatable. 
Um, so while all this uh, kind of shadow open source stuff was going on, so we, uh, we started our official quest into legitimacy. So um, our direct management really helped, uh, helped out a lot with this. So um, as, with, as with many engineering problems that we run into there, a lot of times the problems aren't, uh, the hard part isn't technical, it's political. So we feel very fortunate to have our direct management who's um, very in, in support of, of us. Not only do they want to um, support their engineers and what they do, but they also seem to um, have an interest from a business perspective for all of the um, reasons why uh, contributing to the open source world is a good thing, such as um, hiring, uh, um, et cetera. So um, what we uh, kind of developed a plan. We, uh, we needed to convince upper management all the way through the director level about, uh, about these same uh, advantages of contributing to open source. So, uh, and we did that. We started, we started talking to our director. We started talking to our vice president of, the, uh, of digital retail. And they agreed. They said, hey, that, that sounds great. They, uh, they also wanted to support their engineers, but also saw uh, incredible business uh, potential business benefits from it, including saving money over time if bugs are found earlier, uh, employee retention, uh, talent attraction, et cetera. So, um, so they said, they say, said basically, um, go for it. Um, you just have to convince the gatekeepers. And in our case, uh, our gatekeepers, the big ones, are legal and security. So how do we approach that? So what we did is we reached out to the open source lab and uh, we, we had a couple good meetings with them and they, um, they have a lot of experience with sort of the non-technical side of open source. Um, the legal side, the political side, we figured they'd be um, good, good allies to, uh, to talk with and they graciously agreed. They liked our idea. Um, and um, so they basically outlined some primary concerns that we would probably run into, such as legal liability. So uh, the legal department's gonna wanna know exactly what we're liable for if people start using our software. Um, but luckily we have a lot of very, uh, very cool open source licenses that um, basically explicitly um, say there's no warranty, et cetera. You all have seen that. Um, also, they said uh, that we'd run into competitive advantage issues. So our, um, the powers of B would want to know what we're doing. Are we giving away our competitive advantage? Well, um, we're, a, we're a low profit cooperative in the retail space. We don't exactly compete um, in the software space. So um, we, uh, we figured that that would, be, that, that would help make this whole idea more palatable. Um, and so, they also mentioned about how once we actually have a community, there's going to be some overhead with community management. How do you deal with um, how do you deal with the public trying to contribute to your code? What's your pull request process going to be, et cetera? Um, so we already have somewhat of, a, of an open source like contribution process for our own engineers. Um, it's continuous integration. We have code reviews, and things can't be uh, merged into master until um, several people have reviewed it from each domain. Um, so, so hopefully that'll make it easier um, once, once we actually do start um, uh, contributing in an in official capacity. So um, the next thing that we did, we had a very brief meeting with legal. It was literally about 10 or 15 minutes and they were basically like, look, we don't have time for this right now, but we'll get back to you soon. And uh, that's kind of where, where I left off and that's as far as we got before, uh, before the conference. So, um, but, uh, but coming soon, this is what, what's hopefully coming down, down the line. So we're hopefully going to have some formal meetings with uh, legal and security where we'll be able to uh, present our case. Um, yeah, again, th this is as far as I got. We wanted to, uh, I, we really wanted to go further, but we sort of accepted this as a risk. And um, if you read the description um, of, the, of the talk, this is more about the journey and not exactly about the, the ending. Um, so, but I, but I, again, I still figured that this little, little bit of uh, information would still be hopefully valuable to you all, uh, especially if you, you guys share your own stories near the end. So, um, so yeah, we have, um, in the meantime, we've sort of been preparing to release uh, um, things into the open source world. So once uh, we, we have a bunch of things behind the floodgates, we started designing uh, and modularizing our code in such a way that these would be releasable in, um, in, in an open source way. So that means that um, each, each of these packages, they have um, you know, very limited dependencies on REI, um, REI resources. Um, they are documented. They have unit tests. 
Anyway, we have a number of things that are just sitting behind the floodgates, um, including some pretty cool projects. Like we have this thing called Atlas, which is a uh, JavaScript and CSS source map transformer that helps you transform your CSS into a usable way into your into your infrastructure. We have this thing called Rev, which is an MD5 based cache buster. So whenever you um, uh, make a change to one of your files, we have the ability to bust the cache all the way through your browser, kind of on demand, which is kind of cool. Um, we have these uh, these design patterns, like the three POC, and uh, this is a markup composition inheritance pattern for JSP uh, templates. And if you guys have ever worked with JSP, it's kind of an old, outdated templating language. It doesn't really have the features that you would expect in a contemporary uh, templating language. So we have some interesting patterns that we want to share with the world. Um, we have Shoelace, which is a spinoff of Twitter Bootstrap, and that's our um, style framework that we use for our front-end code. Um, we have Scenery, which is an HTML5 presentation framework. Um, it's actually running this presentation. It's actually pretty cool. Um, it's based off of um, uh, a project that, that Google did a long time ago, but it has like this dual screen thing with speaker notes, and I can actually see the, the next uh, slide coming up and actually control it from this, this window. Um, but anyway, um, that is just about all I have for you. Um, like I said, I apologize about it, it being short, um, but I would really love to open up um, to the floor any experiences that you all have had with um, organizations trying to um, kind of fight the good fight and implement open source contributions in, uh, in your organizations. Um, I'm detecting from body language that you guys um, might not have, have a whole lot. Um, does anybody have any stories to show, uh, share, any successes or advice? Yes. So we're in sort of the middle part of the stage. We're very small, we're a very small unit within two very large organizations. And the first one is legal and mostly around licensing and the idea that the entities own the property that we're working on. So and they, it's a similar like we'll get back to you. Um, and we and also the um, I don't know if you mentioned did you have a requirement for like a, an outside security audit? No, we, we haven't. Um, we haven't actually had uh, a whole lot of conversations around open source with security. Um, they're, they're generally on board and supportive of the engineers, um, but in this case, if they feel like it opens up uh, some security holes. But that's kind of why we're starting with you know, open sourcing somewhat innocuous things like documentation, like wh where's your security hole in that, uh, you know, front end libraries, things like that. Um, what did legal say when you presented some of the, oh, it's still the it's you get back to you kind of thing? Like, okay. Yeah. They usually come back with things that actually it would be useful for us to have our own legal department. Uh -huh. process. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's. So we're sort of finally, you know, we need legal representation for our own legal department. Yeah, that, that's another thing that concerns me as well, because we have this legal department, this security department, and sometimes I worry, what's your motivation to say yes to us right now? Because isn't it a lot easier just to say no, and then you have less work to deal with? So I'm a little, I don't really understand what the motivation is there, but, but we'll see. Yeah, they're, they're all trying to sort of shrink their attack size, you know, both mm -hmm. legal and security, so. Yeah. Like, anything you do is, is essentially going to increase that in their eyes, so. Attack vectors. Yeah, exactly. Like Surfa increase attack the, surfaces. You know, like, yeah, attack surfaces, legally or, or technology-wise, so. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I've been a part of this. I've got some of these in this for a while. I ran into folks who helped me get through this. Really? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm not the only one. There are quite a few of us, especially some of the old guys that have worked for to get to the point where we're tired of working for companies. Mm -hmm. so we've got to bring in these big frigid reports that are covering up. Sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't realize that there were full consultancies that, oh, uh, that did that. That's great. So, um, one of the things we do is talk to lawyers, and I work with a good, a good one of us, and I can't do it good enough that they have to file their own thing. Um, another one that we do is uh, help you develop the, the compelling story that you tell the board. Because generally, legal teams and security teams are just as represented as the front end and the advisory system. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Yeah, software developers seem to be kind of scarce these days. So I think that's um, you know uh, one of the reasons why management uh, seemed to get on board pretty quickly. Gotcha. Well, good. I'm glad to glad to hear that we're we're not that far off. And no, no, it looks it, it all looks good, and it's always better to use the world of your own mm -hmm. than to hire one of us. Okay. Good deal. Job security outside of software development. But so, if you wanna, if you wanna catch them, I yeah, I, I would love to to um, touch base with you the after most, after this. Okay, fantastic. I'll have, you said his name was Carl Fogel? And what is your name, just in case I miss you? Very nice, thank you. Um, does anybody? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So basically what, what um, at least the front end team has done is we have started um, kind of massively modularizing anything new that we make. And it's mostly because we have, um, we have a bit of a monolith for REI.com and it takes a really long time for the whole thing to build and none of us like waiting for it. So part of the motivation for that was, hey, let's, if we can like gut that code or start a new project and it doesn't have to be in this monolith, let's do that. So um, to answer your question, basically everything that we do, um, the new stuff is modularized in this way. So yeah, if we can, if I can sit on my uh, on my little MacBook Air in a coffee shop and just run uh, unit tests, watching all of my code and just watch it turn from red to green without having to compile anything, that's that's bliss. So yeah, we've actually started doing that sort of uh, from a cultural standpoint. Um, how, oh, you mean do we consume any open source for us? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We run an almost entirely open source code base. So REI.com, it's all running on Java, basically. Um, a lot of our, um, let's see, what else? Yeah, our mobile apps, those are all running uh, or built on open source software. And again, that was one of our motivation where we uh, recognize that we're taking so much and not really giving any back, and we want to change that. So, um, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering if you think about making the engineering block public. I hope so. I hope as part of this, uh, as part of this, we'll maybe be able to revisit this code.rei.com um, because, yeah, we've. Um, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who like to know uh, how we solve things using a stack that was, you know, developed uh, in the in the '90s. So we have a lot of uh, really interesting workarounds. The the JSP templating is is a good example of that, where it's like we're kind of stuck with this. So how do we solve um, these new problems, uh, um, but on a really old stack? So yeah, I, to answer your question, I, I really hope that we're able to revisit that. Nice. The thing that I noticed right away is if I make an order on REI.com and then I cancel it, it doesn't let me do that with a, a large uh, dollar value item where it does on Amazon. I guess my main question is how is REI.com different from other marketplaces? Uh, it seems to me that perhaps there would be a certain type of software that could handle everything REI.com needs and the same of many other companies. But is that not true? 
Sure, that's, um, that's a really good question. Um, I can uh, only speak to ARIA.com's code base, but it's something that's kind of grown and evolved over a long period of time. So um, there hasn't really been a discussion about um, you know, recognizing a lot of these, a lot of these uh, common marketplace type software and saying um, there hasn't really been a good case to be like, let's, let's reevaluate um, how our entire marketplace is set up so maybe we can bring in some open source software to solve some of these problems versus, hey, there's this one tiny problem, just go fix it. So um, yeah, we get comments all the time. You know, it's a, it's a running, constantly growing piece of software that's constantly uh, getting its own bugs and whatnot. Um, and we'll just, we just kind of fire them uh, one, one at a time. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, but, but I actually don't I, don't, I don't know. We haven't gotten to that, that point. I think you had a question. Yes. What, what is your license? I'm sorry. Um, I might have misphrased that. I meant that um, you're talking about when employees release things um, open source on the weekends. What I meant to say uh, was that we release it under our own copyright um, with an open source license. So we don't like invent our own open source license. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God. Yeah, no, no. Um, at least. Um, um, from what I've noticed, people generally will release things under um, very permissive licenses, yeah. um, like MIT, for example. Um, it's a really, really common one that people release things under. You enter uh, quite a realm of nightmares if you think your own license and try and be compatible with else. You know what? It kind of goes with uh, what this gentleman in the back was saying. You know, if you have something that works, why not use that instead? Um, but yeah, no, we don't. Yeah, <laughs> good question. No, um, I don't think that we're uh, at a mature enough point in our discussion at REI to be even talking at that level of um, specificity. Um, we, we've just been like basically, here are these common open source licenses, and here, here is how uh, these open source licenses uh, address your concerns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sure. That's, that's a good call out. Um, and that's actually a reason why I personally like to release things under uh, very permissive licenses, because I don't want to force anybody else to change their licenses. So, um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I actually, I actually don't have a lot of information on that. Um, I know that I think we switched to Java 8 fairly frequent, or recently. Um, I, that's pretty much the most information that I have on, on Java. Uh, no, it's not. Definitely not. Um, and that's something that um, I found was a, kind of a problem at Boeing. There was a lot of, since every piece of software that you brought in was really heavily scrutinized, people ended up being uh, um, very, uh, um, you know, multiple um, years and multiple versions behind everything. I have a kind of a funny story that um, I can share with you offline while I'm not being recorded <laughs> about that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, in my experience, RIA has been pretty good about keeping, uh, keeping pace with um, the rest of the industry, trying to keep things up to date and whatnot. Sure, or use a use an alternative or something like that. Sure. Anybody else have any any other questions, comments, or go ahead. So the other big thing that people trip over after they do this is not so much about the releasing or the changing as the Okay.
Sure. Yeah, we actually do a lot of that. Um, we actually do a lot of uh, reaching out to the wild and pulling in things as part of our dependency management system. Okay. That's exactly one of what we do. <laughs> Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Yep, All right. that's good advice. What was, um, do you remember the name of the software um, that analyzes the code and um, lets you know about Blackjack. open source? Blackjack. Was it Black? Okay, Fossology, Black Duck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, on second thought, maybe we don't want them as involved in our uh, engineering process. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this, uh, by the way, this uh, whole slide deck is online. Um, you can get it with um, with this QR code, um, but it's at reidev.github.io slash Ospridge. Um, and my contact information is on the first slide if anyone wants to reach out. Um, I'd love to have more conversations about this and hear about um, your journeys as well. So yeah, I, th I guess that's it. Thank you very much for having me.